Um, all right, so, so let's get started. So again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, delighted to be able to uh, talk to an interested group of people about Chameleon. So um, as David mentioned, I uh, did a bunch of different projects uh, uh, over time. Most recently, what I have been doing is uh, building an experimental testbed for computer science. So I did a lot of work in cloud computing, and one thing that we found was very difficult to do is to uh, test your research and or uh, you know run, run experiments with your research and so we decided to fix this problem for ourselves and for others and uh, uh, our cloud computing research is also of course uh, continuing but um, for for a spell of time here we focused on on building uh, experimental infrastructure so uh, you know to, to start off the seminar is why why is it important to experiment? And I'd like to start with a quotation uh, from Donald Knuth, who is the father of computer science. And, and this is a much quoted um, um, uh, part of, of one of his letters, which says, beware of bugs in the above code. I have only proved it correct, not tried it. Right? And so why is he saying that? Why is Donald Knuth, who we can be sure can construct a correct proof saying that uh, the, the, you know, despite the uh, proof, uh, maybe the code has some bugs. And the answer to that question comes from uh, something that somebody uh, very different said. If I can only somehow manage to advance the slides, there we go. Um, the, the difference between theory and practice is that in theory, there's no difference, right? In practice, there is. So this is why we experiment. When we want to reason about our world, about the universe, we construct models, right? And, and they are essential to our understanding of the problem, right? If, if you run an experiment and then, uh, on your workstation and say, I discovered something that is true of my workstation, that doesn't have much significance. It doesn't have much impact. But if you can construct a model and if you can uh, develop, let's say, a new uh, caching algorithm, and you can verify it on relevant architectures, including your workstation, that is of great interest. People can then use that and, and see if uh, what they have fits your model, and then use your results to, uh, to improve uh, what they're running. But there are problems with models, right? First of all, they might be incorrect. They might be too complex, which means we can't very well use them to, to reason about things. They might not be complex enough, right? Which means they don't capture the, um, the relevant phenomena. And, and most of all, in order to discover models in the first place, we have to gain some insights, right? So in order to connect the dots, we first need to have some dots. And in order to have those dots, we run experiments to get a feel for how various systems behave. But when we experiment, it's, it's not so easy, right? So first of all, we need an isolated system. If you and I are running on the same system and you're running some experiments, whatever I do on the system will impact them. You'll probably get a different result every time, right? And, and, and you won't know why. Well, it's because I'm, I'm generating some random load or at least random from, from the perspective of your experiment and it's impacting whatever you're doing. So unless we run isolated experiments, Re repeatability is hard, right? So repeatability, being able to run the same, repeat the same experiment exactly the same way many, many times, um, it's very hard. Reproducibility, which means that somebody else, your colleague perhaps, or somebody who reads your paper could reproduce your experiment is even harder, right? Because they might not have access to the same hardware. Uh, that you ran the experiment on, they might not have access to the exact same uh, conditions, the exact same environment uh, that you experimented under because you have to describe this experiment environment, you have to capture it in some way. So all those things are, are, are very difficult and we wanted to build a test bed that would fulfill those needs for isolation for deep reconfigurability, for having control of, of multiple uh, factors on the system you're experimenting with, and control. And so how did we build this system? So we, we sort of postulated uh, a few properties that a system like that has to have. Uh, so first of all, we said, well, if we're going to build an experimental environment, it has to be large scale. 
because uh, the hot problems, research problems in computer science these days, they focus on things like big data, um, HPC, where well, you, you maybe build something on a small scale, but in order to do serious research, you need to be able to, to see whether it scales. So accordingly, uh, we build a system that is um, over 600 nodes. It's about 15,000 cores. Uh, it's got five petabytes of storage space distributed over two sites that are connected with a 100G network, right? So within those parameters, we felt you could, you could fit uh, many of the computer science experiments. Secondly, we said, well, the system has to be very deeply reconfigurable. It has to be as close as possible to having it in your lab. In other words, you have to have the same level of information about the system that you have in your lab. You have to be able to reconfigure the system at a very fine grain level. So you need to be able to uh, power it on, power it off, and reboot, and of course have root and, and have access to console. You need to be able to boot to, boot to custom kernels. You need to be able, in other words, to do all the um, systems actions that you would be able to take on hardware that you own. Um, you have to have access to isolated environments, in other words, uh, to the situation where you're running on the system, nobody's running the same nodes that, that you're running. And you need to have some fundamental uh, support for reproducible experiments, and I'll elaborate on that later. Um, and then when, when we were building the system, I actually personally interviewed about 20 different uh, research groups, and they told me what experimental um, needs they had. Uh, many of them were, were things that I knew uh, from my own experience. But one very interesting thing that many people said is, you know, hardware is a very good thing, but what we need for research on cloud computing specifically is we need to have uh, workloads and traces that represent um, uh, interesting, realistic uh, cloud computing loads. And so they said, well, what we would like to have uh, at this workload and trace archive that represents such loads. And so we partnered when we were building this project with uh, folks at CERN at Open Science Data Cloud. Uh, we're uh, hoping to extend this partnership to other clouds. People are configuring increasingly many uh, different production quality clouds, open stack installations mostly. But we also partnered with Rackspace and Google, which are commercial clouds. And of course, Google made some cloud traces available, uh, but on a, on a sort of more of a one-off basis. What we would like to have is a, a repository that has the same trace format, right? So you can compare different traces uh, that, that come from different sources as complete as possible representation, as well as tools that allow you to generate specific loads based on traces that somebody else provided. And then also uh, connected to us means partnership with users who are configuring interesting environments and, and running experiments with them that are described in the papers, but then are also interested in sharing those environments with others so that the research that you publish in your paper becomes reproducible. So you can publish an environment in which you run. We publish the information at the test bed at that given time when you ran. Both of those things can be referenced in your papers and both of, both of those things can be made easy to use to others who want to reproduce your experiments or extend them, right? Build on, on what you've done. And then you notice that our testbed scales in the number of nodes and scales in storage, but it does not scale in the number of sites. We've got only two sites. And this is because in the US, for example, we've got another testbed called Genie, uh, which is a network, networking testbed, has about 50 sites. But those are very small sites, are very, very few resources, or like, like just a few nodes at each site. And so we said, well, that dimension of scalability is already covered elsewhere. We will seek to interoperate with Genie uh, and provide resources in, in different dimensions. And in fact, we do have identity-based uh, uh, interoperability with Genie at this point, federation with Genie, sorry. And then the last thing we said is we would like this testbed to be sustainable. This is not going to be the, the test bed to be all and end, end all. We would like to create a blueprint for a facility that we could then give to others, and those others could uh, uh, configure their own experimental facility. And they could federate with Chameleon, or it could be a, a closed experimental facility for specific communities. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a blueprint. It's a way to 
uh, configure resources in a new way. So um, a few words about what the hardware is that we're running with. So the basic building block of Chameleon is uh, what we call standard cloud unit. It's essentially a rack that has almost 50 nodes. Um, we've got 12 of those racks. Most of them are, are, are configured in large homogeneous partition to support the, um, the high performance computing experiments, the experiments that need as much scale as possible. Um, we've got uh, 3.6 petabytes of, of central uh, storage, and that's configured right now as an image server for uh, the images that, uh, uh, that people run on Chameleon, um, as well as object store for experimental data. So we've got petabytes of object store, dual replicated object store at this point where people can, um, can store data for big data experiments. That was again, very much experiment driven. People who run big data experiments told us, well, you know, sometimes it takes a day or two to just upload the experimental data to the test bed, right? So we wanted to have that actually stored on the test bed so that everybody could run. And in addition to that, we've got some um, heterogeneous hardware as well. So a little bit more detail about all this hardware for the, uh, the basic building blocks, the standard cloud units, uh, each rack has 42 uh, Intel Haswell compute nodes. And in addition, it also has four storage nodes. Each storage node has um, 16 two terabyte drives. So uh, you can think about it as a, as a very high IO bandwidth large disk. So if you uh, uh, think about it in terms of the whole rack, if you add up all the uh, you know, 16 nodes times time two, ter two terabytes times um, uh, four storage nodes, you get 128 terabytes uh, per rack. And if you add it across the 12 racks, that's about 1.5 petabytes. So the 1.5 petabyte is distributed over the racks. You can allocate nodes within the rack. You can allocate them across the rack. For example, you could allocate all the storage nodes in the system and build a large storage cluster, like, like a Hadoop cluster, for example, a very powerful Hadoop cluster. Or you could um, allocate on the, uh, on the level of a rack. If you allocate the whole rack, nobody's using your internal network, so you can then have network isolation as well. Um, and then um, as far as uh, our heterogeneous hardware goes, the strategy, the strategy here was to graft heterogeneous element onto a homogeneous base. So we wanted to put as much money as possible into developing this homogeneous base so you can run uh, large scale experiments. But then one rack, in addition to uh, Ethernet, has InfiniBand. So you can run experiments with InfiniBand, compare that with Ethernet. Um, we've got a couple nodes with uh, memory hierarchies. So those are nodes that have almost a terabyte of memory each. They have uh, non-volatile memory. They have uh, single state drives, SSDs, and, and HDDs. So you can, you can experiment with uh, different algorithms uh, with those memory systems. We've got uh, a couple of NVIDIA K80 GPUs, a couple of M40 GPUs. Um, we will be announcing tomorrow probably FPGAs, uh, which uh, very much in demand, uh, a lot of interest in that. And uh, by the end of the year, we will deploy um, Atom microservers and ARM microservers. Well, those are uh, non-x86 chips. Those, this is a different architecture, so we could not graph those onto our homogeneous base. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we will provide them as a separate cluster. Now, um, a few words about what types of experiment we're supporting on the testbed right now. So we think about it in, in terms of this three-layer cake, right? So at the bottom of the cake, we support experiments that um, uh, deal with virtualization and operating systems and uh, technologies at that level. And the people who run those experiments, they, they really need um, a lot of control. They really do need this console access and, and the ability to boot from custom kernel and so forth. But they also have a level of skill that is required to, boot, to, to build those custom kernels and, and so forth, right? So um, very skilled users requiring a lot of control. Now, if we go to the other end of the spectrum now on, on top of the system, we've got users who are maybe not as skilled, uh, educational users, uh, application users who are, uh, for example, exploring the cloud computing paradigm, whether that's suitable for their application. 
um, and, and they are not ready to uh, build custom kernels necessarily. And what they need is something with relatively easy access. So at that level, we provide an OpenStack KVM cloud, just a vanilla OpenStack KVM cloud, and it's seeing a lot of use from educational projects in particular, but it's also seeing use from people who are um, developing resource management algorithms on top of clouds, for example. They do a lot of their development there, but then when they want to assess performance, then they want an isolated environment. Now, this, this KVM, OpenStack KVM cloud, that's a shared environment, right? So, so you can't, it's not really suitable for uh, doing performance analysis. So what these users then do is they drop into this middle layer, they get a bare metal partition, which they boot into a pre-configured appliance, so pre-configured bare metal image, right? So, so appliance is just sort of generic work that describes things like containers, virtual machines, um, you know, bare metal images and so forth. I, we just use appliance because we support both virtual machines and bare metal images and don't want to keep saying that, you know, enumerating them every time, right? So appliance is a, a generic word for that. So, so using bare metal configuration, booting into bare metal images, it's almost as e easy as, as uh, uh, booting virtual machines on OpenStack. And we've got some bare metal images that we make available to our users, so they can do it quite easily. And, 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 and so uh, uh, the users, when they want to run an isolated environment, uh, they can deploy their own OpenStack cloud and, uh, and then run experiments on top of that OpenStack cloud. Okay, so um, I would like to um, maybe go through the uh, experimental workflow a little bit and tell you the, about the requirements, the specific requirements that shape the test bed. So if you think about the uh, typical um, experimental workflow, so of course, first of all, you have to design the experiment, you have to decide what types of things you need, but once you decide that, you go out on a search, you know, where can I find those resources? And so the first step in, in structuring that experiment is really to discover those resources. And one thing we heard from users is that the descriptions have to be fine-grained and like really, really fine-grained, sometimes down to the serial numbers of individual components. Because if uh, a node uh, is broken and somebody replaces that node and this new node has a different power signature, for example, and, and you re you're trying to rerun your experiment, the experiment that you were running a few weeks ago, getting different results, you would like to know that this happened. Right? You'd like to know that this is a factor that might have influenced why, why you can't repeat your experiment now. Well, it has to be, of course, complete, but it also has to be up to date. And that implies a certain level of automation, right? So a certain level of uh, having tools that can diagnose the node and whether something changed. Because um, if you leave that to uh, the human, uh, first of all, you're dealing with human error, but, but secondly, so dealing with a human, uh, well, I'll do it tomorrow, and then uh, getting distracted and maybe not necessarily doing that, right? So um, at this point, when we make a change in the test bed, we just simply rerun scripts that discover the properties of the test bed and the versions of the firmware and all those things, and we update the test bed description. And then, very importantly, it has to be versioned. So, you know, useful as those serial numbers and those very fine grained descriptions and the version numbers on the firmware are, um, every time we come to the test bed to rerun our experiment, we don't want to go through this really excruciatingly detailed and very, very long list of, of various things that might have changed, right? What we would like to do is look at the version of the test bed and see if it changed. If it didn't change, we're done. If it has changed, well, maybe we need to check on a few things. So we have been versioning the testbed with every single change. We, the testbed has been in operation for about a year now. And just as a matter of curiosity, we've had about 30 different versions since, uh, since we started running the testbed. So, you know, within a year, about 30 different versions. But versions are very useful. Uh, when you write a paper based on Chameleon, you can say this was run on Chameleon version 28. And, and for a long time, everybody will be able to come to our webpage, check out exactly 
what Chameleon version 28 was, how the hardware and the firmware was configured at that time. And finally, one last thing, we would like this test bed to be verifiable. In other words, when you do actually lay your hands on the resources, it's great to be able to run um, a, a little sanity check, a little script that makes sure that the resources are indeed as they were advertised, right? Because if you put it, um, let's say some memory uh, segments went bad, if you, if you put uh, into the operating system, it might just mark those segments as bad, put into less memory than you were expecting to get and not tell you about this, right? So. Uh, uh, for you know di different experiments uh, track these things at different level but as a sanity check is good to verify all right so once you discover the resources you you decide which resources you want to use whether it's gpus or pgas or or some storage nodes and then you provision them so in other words you want to acquire a temporary ownership of those resources and of course ideally we would do that on demand but if you really want to get hundreds of nodes, and that possibly might mean reserving the whole test bed, when at any given time when you come to the test bed, chances are that somebody is already running, right? Some people are already running, and you will never be able to get everything, right? Or if you get, um, if you want to run on the uh, GPUs, which are very much in demand on the test bed, uh, chances are you come and they are, uh, you know, there are already people using them you need to uh, create an advanced reservation, right? Uh, for a very um, rare resource, such as the whole test bed, maybe on the weekend, right? Maybe uh, a couple of weeks in the future. Uh, so it's, it's uh, important to support advanced reservation. Secondly, we already talked about it, it needs to be isolated and we need to be able to get resources on the fine grain. So once you get the ownership of, of some nodes, or let's say Iraq, what you want to do is reconfigure them. You may want to run with CentOS, you may want to run with Ubuntu, you may want to boot into a custom kernel. Um, where do you take those things? Well, it would be good to have some pre-configured images, so for that it would be good to have a, an appliance catalog where you can find those things um, and, and use them. Um, snapshotting, very important to save your work. Um, so let's say you develop a new algorithm, algorithm, algorithm uh, you uh, install it all on an image in the test bed, now you'd like to save it, make it available as others. Maybe um, in, you reference it as a, as a digital object identifier in your paper, right? But, but have a snapshot, have a saved version that is very easy for others to deploy so they can reproduce their experiments. Might also, those others might also be, uh, you know, new people coming to your lab. Right? How do I get started quickly? Where well, here's appliance. And then finally, we want support for complex appliances. In other words, um, something like OpenStack installation, for example, if you have to configure it by hand, they can take a very long time. Uh, but if you have uh, something that can configure it automatically for you to so deploy a virtual cluster with one click, well, that is much easier. Right? So uh, users told us that they wanted support for that as well. And so finally, you've got a system that you own, that you configure to your requirements, and now you need to be able to monitor. And that monitoring needs to be fine-grained um, and needs to um, uh, ret return results that are, you know, not always necessarily available by the system. So for example, one of our users wants to instrument the racks with temperature sensors, well, we'll be providing that temperature sensor uh, information to others as well. Um, okay, and so now, how did we implement a system that that uh, fulfills all those requirements? So, um, in order to illustrate that, I've got a, a little visualization for you of um, what it was like when we started it, right? And here it is, a blank page, right? We started with a blank page, we started with absolutely nothing. We had some ideas of what the requirements were from those user interviews. Uh, we had ideas of our architecture and we had ideas of um, several different implementations that we were going to use, right? But beyond those ideas, we didn't have anything implemented. And we said, well, this is a tremendous opportunity because it allows us to uh, build a system that leverages uh, the good things that are available uh, in the open source community right now. So just a, a quick summary of, of how we built it. Well, of course, uh, starting with the requirements uh, at the proposal writing time, as soon as the project got funded, 
uh, we created an architecture and then started the fun part, which was the technology and, and risk uh, evaluation. And we considered many options. Uh, we considered software from the Grid 5000 project, which is an experimental infrastructure in France with very similar requirements to Chameleon. We considered, of course, Nimbus, which, uh, as David said earlier on, was, was the first open source infrastructure as a service implementation that came from my group. So we were experts in, in doing that. But we also considered OpenStack, uh, which is, of course, the open source implementation of infrastructure as a service that is very popular nowadays. And just at that time, they, they released something called Ironic on a trial basis. Now, Ironic is, is a component of OpenStack that allows you to reconfigure nodes on a bare metal level. So instead of deploying virtual machines, you reconfigure nodes on bare metal level. And it wasn't an official uh, component of OpenStack at the time. And so we said, well, let's evaluate it and let's see you know, what risk management we can come up for it with. Uh, but but uh, generally speaking, um, it was tremendously appealing to use a, a very popular open source platform for this project uh, because, because that allows us to work with the community closely and come up with a sustainable solution. Um, so once we went through this evaluation risk mitigation phase, the implementation of core capabilities actually went very quickly. It took us only three months. And again, I'll, I'll say in detail what, what that looked like. Um, and it's cheating a little bit because, uh, you know, if we, if we plowed into the risk without uh, evaluating it, it would certainly have taken much more. So we probably should, have, should include that evaluation phase in there as well. But it's, but it's better to say it took us three months. So the resulting product is something that is very strongly based on OpenStack. We, we uh, estimate that about 65%, certainly much more than half, is OpenStack. We did borrow some technology from Grid 5000 because they had very good uh, discovery capabilities. And about 25%, about a quarter of it is our own special sauce, right? So things that we had to change. And to tell you in detail what we changed, I'm going to go over again through those four stages of the experiment. So for discovery, we used uh, Grid 5000 capabilities. Uh, we enhanced that by developing a portal, making it very easy for users to uh, interact with it and, and uh, just integrating it with the infrastructure that we were using. Um, for provisioning resources, uh, we used OpenStack Nova. But here there was a problem. OpenStack Nova does not support advanced reservations. It only supports on demand. So uh, we looked and we found a, a sort of a, 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 an incubator project called Blazar, incubator of the SAC project. And at the time when we found it, it wasn't really a production quality software, but we figured, well, since we want advanced reservations, it's worth investing in, into developing uh, production, in bringing it to production. And, uh, and we started, we did that, um, and, and we made it part of our deployment. So in addition to Blazar, then we also made some extensions to support um, nice visualization of, of resource availability. So the Gantt chart um, that you see here on the, uh, um, on the slide. So on the, on the y-axis, you've got nodes. And on the x-axis, you've got time. And for example, you can see that somebody's running on the test bed. Right? And then somebody made an advanced reservation that takes the whole test bed. And so actually, let me see if I can maybe show you what it looks like in practice. So this is, this is real time. If you went to Chameleon Portal and looked for this, this is what you'd find. And you see that some leases, like this green, this olive green lease here, uh, are very large. You know, and some other leases, like this, this bright green lease here, are very small. It's just one node. But in general, you know, you can, you can uh, look at a lease, you can, you can see who's running, what project uh, it's part of, and, and so forth. Um, so then um, for uh, configuring resources, right, how we configure and interact, like I said, we used OpenStack Ironic. We used Glance, which is the OpenStack uh, image server, and we used the OpenStack meta servers. We had to add snapshotting. There was no and still isn't snapshotting implementation for Ironic. There might be something in future releases. And we added an appliance catalog and, and the management of the appliance catalog. So let me see if I go back here. So there we go. This is our appliance catalog. We support various different appliances. You can 
you can run with CentOS, for example. You have CentOS with CUDA to run with our uh, GPU systems. You've got Ubuntu, of course, as well. Um, and, and here, for example, uh, there's an appliance called COMPS, which was uh, developed by users from Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and it has infrastructure that they use that they wanted to share with others. And so in addition, you've got um, all sorts of other goodies here, uh, MPI that has been made efficient for InfiniBand uh, in virtual, with virtualization and, and things like that. Um, so those were things that we developed right now. And then for instrumentation monitoring, we use Solometer, which is an aggregator, uh, and it works roughly like any aggregator works, which is you've got various agents that are deployed in places where the measurements take place. Uh, so for example, on the nodes or on the PDU or, or places like that. And they send metrics to the uh, Solometer, which uh, uh, serves as a, as a server of those metrics. You can, you can extract them from there later on. Um, a quick note on project timeline. The project started two years ago. Um, first, we configured a little bridge system. Um, I used to be part of a project called Future Grid, which was essentially providing um, uh, clouds, OpenStack clouds, for the community. So it was the precursor from, of, of many cloud systems that we're seeing now. Um, uh, and, and so the first action that we did was create a bridge for that community so they could get started on coming on very quickly. Uh, between January and March, we developed CHI, which is Chameleon, stands for Chameleon Infrastructure, which is the uh, system we, we're using now to configure Chameleon, uh, and then moved on to uh, configuring, putting CHI on the new hardware that we developed. And in July of 2015, so a little bit over a year from now, uh, we announced public availability. Whoops. Um, 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 uh, 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 you know, divulging all the secrets of, of the stuff that's coming that's coming up. So anyhow, today in the facility we've got about 1,100 users, so over a thousand users, and about 230 projects. And and this year we are still releasing heterogeneous hardware. Like I said earlier, there's still some to come. All right, so over a thousand users, what do they do on the infrastructure? And here's just a, a tour of uh, just a few projects that are in, in various ways um, representative of, of the things that users are doing. So here is a first project from Yu Yuzu, who's a student at University of Pittsburgh. She did this project last year. Um, her group works on, on the development of lightweight virtualization technologies. The group is led by uh, Jack Lange. And um, as, as a warm-up project for her research, she was comparing the performance of Docker and, and the performance of KVM and how they scale and so forth. Um, so she needed a test bed that, yes, absolutely provided bare metal reconfiguration. She needed to boot from custom kernel. She needed console access uh, in order uh, to uh, you know, troubleshoot if the kernel was not custom enough. Uh, she needed up-to-date hardware. And she needed to run large-scale experiments, right? Because there's a lot of um, results from head-to-head uh, -head comparison of KVM and Docker on a node or two, but there isn't much at scale. And so actually, the ultimate result of her research was that if you set up KVM properly, then actually the performance does not look so bad. But uh, here, I, I'm showing just one graph that shows you that she ran experiment on 64 nodes. I know that she had some results with 256 56 nodes, and, and below here you see Yuyu uh, showing off her poster at, at supercomputing last year. Um, so this is one project. Uh, here's another one, which is the development of Exascale operating system. This project is from Swan Peranu uh, at Argon National Lab, um, and, and they've got this uh, project called Argo, which is developing a new system for, uh, for the exascale machines. As you know, at Argon, we've got, we build supercomputers, and the supercomputers, if you have a new supercomputer, can't really install the old operating system on it, might not be able to use all of its capabilities. Uh, so there's some research that needs to be done uh, in order to understand how to use the new capabilities most efficiently. And his needs were, again, very similar to your use. He needed bare metal reconfiguration, uh, boot kernels with different parameters, but mostly what he needed is very fast reconfiguration because his experiments were 
trying out various different operating systems configurations, different images, different uh, kernels, different parameters of those kernels. So he needed, he was essentially running the same thing, but booting into many different environments very quickly. And he needed hardware that supported modern capabilities that had many cores. We've got 24 core nodes, uh, promise characters, and so forth. And here you've got Swan um, also showing off his work at, um, at Supercomputing last year. Um, another project, now from the other end of the spectrum, very different project, is a project from University of Arkansas at, um, at Pine Bluff. It's, it's one of the historically black colleges in the USA, and it's a place that has uh, a lot of talented people, but not many resources that they can do their work on. So uh, we were delighted that we could uh, provide, provide resources to them. Uh, they were working on, on modeling multi-stage intrusion attacks, so modeling and classifying them. Um, and there were specific uh, tools that uh, do some of that detection, and they were extending the capabilities of those tools to support more uh, different attacks. And what they needed was something very different. They needed an easy-to-use OpenStack installation that also uh, users from many different uh, institutions could access. Um, and so uh, that, that was very good use case for our OpenStack KVM installation. Um, another here example, research example, is from uh, RENSI, uh, in University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and, and they were working on, on federated network clouds for domain science. So the picture that you see um, uh, above, the, uh, above the picture of the actual uh, team that did those experiments is a picture of Genie. The, the infrastructure that I said earlier has about 50 different sites. Now, they have 50 different sites with very small um, uh, computing capabilities, and they wanted to federate with Chameleon, so they wanted to stitch the network to Chameleon in order to run experiments on the larger infrastructures. So on one hand, they could explore um, a very high level of geographical distribution and, and do infra interesting networking things. On the other hand, they could also run on, on HPC machines. So you're stitching uh, layer two networks and, and we're trying to uh, use InfiniBand and SRIOV uh, together with, with moving large amounts of data in a very controlled fashion, in other words, using the, the Gini capabilities. Um, and finally, an education example. This is example from University of Arizona. And, and this is a very interesting idea that somebody had for a project-based class. Uh, what, what they were doing is they were taking a, a, a cosmology application, essentially, or an application that was doing data mining to find exoplanets. Exoplanets, I'm told, are, are planets that orbit other stars than the sun. Um, and, and it's one of those applications that take you know, several days when it's running on somebody's workstation, but it parallelizes very well. It's, it's pleasantly parallel. So it's possible to, um, if you can get on-demand resources, when they need to run it, to go out to the cloud and provision resources on demand and burst out to the clan, cloud and, and run it in, in one hour instead of several days. So uh, what the, the, the interesting idea for the class was to gather up some computer science students and have them develop um, an infrastructure that does this bursting out to the cloud as part of the class and then later on provide that as a, as a utility to the community. So what they needed was an easy to use infrastructure as a service, uh, KVM installation, and was important was easy to use, well-documented, had training materials for students uh, that, that they could get started with minimal startup time, and they needed some, some data, uh, some storage capabilities for their data. And that was, you know, they, they didn't begin to make a large dent into, into the storage capabilities that we have, but they were very glad that they were there in case they did need them. Okay, um, now uh, just a few words about uh, how specifically those capabilities were developed. So as you know, Chameleon is uh, an animal that blends into its surroundings very well. So for example, it blends into your, your requirements for an environment, right? If you need Ubuntu, it'll be Ubuntu. If you need uh, CentOS, it'll be CentOS. But also, um, this in the second year of the project, around, around holidays, we found that our logo was blending in with the holidays, right? So um, uh, last, the, the first one was at, at New Year's, 
we said, well, in the first year, our, our mantra was to make things possible. So we developed Qi, we deployed new hardware, made core capabilities available to users. Around Valentine's Day, we found that we were able to get uh, our user to give our users uh, the ability to book from custom kernel and and gave them console access as well so that uh, they actually had control over it uh, we upgraded our openstack installation to liberty which brought many new capabilities and we also created the appliance marketplace and the different appliances or you know the first few of the different appliances that i was demonstrating earlier and then finally around Independence Day, it was also uh, a big uh, holiday in the United States. Uh, we uh, had more heterogeneous hardware. We gave our users the object store and, and various appliance tools and, and more and more appliances. And this Monday, there's another holiday called Halloween. And uh, I have it on good authority that there will be another announcement, another fancy uh, playful take on, on our logo. And uh, we're going to be releasing um, FPGAs. We're going to be releasing complex appliance tools, uh, new complex appliances for MPI, for OpenStack, uh, for uh, MPI with SRIOV in virtual machines. So all sorts of uh, interesting goodies. And of course, there's a holiday or two left in the year. And, uh, and we expect Chameleon to, to blend into those as well. So uh, a few parting thoughts. Uh, so first of all, uh, the objective of the project was to build an experimental facility, an experimental instrument for computer science research. You know, the main scientists have various telescopes, microscopes, tokamaks, things like that. Computer scientists need an experimental tool as well. Secondly, it's an open test bed. In other words, um, uh, anybody having computer science experiments uh, can run. For international users, we sometimes ask about U.S. collaborators, since this is sponsored by U.S. taxpayers, uh, something like that needs to happen. We don't check them uh, very uh, particularly, and, uh, and uh, you know, those, those can be very loose collaborations, I should say. Uh, so uh, everybody is pretty much invited. Uh, we went from vision to reality very, very quickly and with very little effort invested. Um, part of that was building on um, infrastructure that already existed on, on OpenStack. Although, as probably anybody who is working with OpenStack knows, it's not an easy to tame beast. And so, um, you know, that, that did take some, some time and effort. Um, and then one final thought is that we have built a blueprint for a new operations model that gives you a lot more control and a lot more information for over things that will allow you to build uh, reproducible computer science experiments or really reproducible experiments, any kind of experiment that has to do with computing, right? So the, the methods that, that we developed for, um, for uh, management, managing information about resources, for example, uh, they are easy enough that they could be more widely adopted the, uh, the various, the snapshotting of environments and so forth could be adopted by others as well. We made a point of, since, since we had the, um, the ability to start from scratch, we made a point of picking a, a sustainable infrastructure, a, a widely used uh, commodity software. Uh, this has benefits for us because, you know, like with the Liberty upgrade, uh, every so often there is a big feature dump that comes from the community uh, and we can and we can install that, maybe enhance that, uh, very often enhance that, and and give it to our users. So, for example, one one nice thing that would be good to have from OpenStack is Cinder for bare metal. That has not been released yet. Um, we are talking to various groups that are working on something like that. But it would be a fantastic thing to be able to link your experimental data to instances that you have. Uh, secondly, it has benefits for broader community because all the things, all the enhancements to OpenStack we developed, we're contributing them back. All the enhancements that are not relevant to OpenStack are open sourced, right? So uh, you, can, you can leverage uh, all of that. And it has also benefits for other testbeds. So again, um, um, 
choosing a very popular software system, uh, popular open source software systems, means that the infrastructure is much easier to adopt for other facilities. They might already have people who are trained in administering OpenStack, or they are looking to, uh, to acquire that expertise. And so that, that makes it much easier to adopt than something that, that very often that has been built from scratch. Okay, last but not least, I wanted to give um, a shout out to the main players in Chameleon. Uh, myself, of course, you know, I'm the Chameleon PI, and I am also in charge of, of uh, the requirements on the science director and the architect. Uh, Pierre Rito on, on my team at University of Chicago is our DevOps lead. He is the, uh, uh, the person who does um, the Chameleon development on a day-to-day, -day, well, leads Chameleon development. He's not the only person uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Dan Stanzion uh, in, the, in the low right corner here, he is the brains behind um, Chameleon hardware and how it should be structured to provide good experimental capabilities. Um, and of course, um, he's the uh, director of TAC. Um, so, so um, the the sort of he's he's the other in charge of the other side of Chameleon, other than University of Chicago. And then we have Joe Mambretti, who works on programmable networks, uh, make sure that we're interoperable with Genie to the extent that we can. DK Panda, who works on high performance networking, makes sure that people can run interesting experiments with our InfiniBand installation. And Paul Rudd, who is uh, at University of Texas, San Antonio, is also a vice president at Drugspace, is our industry liaison, makes sure that, um, that we leverage our connections uh, to the industry as much as possible. So this is, this is all I have. And um, thank you for your attention. Do you have questions? <laughs>